Good morning and welcome to this gathering of the Bridge family. I want to ask you a couple of questions as we get ready to begin and you're going to recognize a couple of these questions because I'm picking up right where we left off last time. Before we pray, let me ask you this. Where do apples come from? Now, some of you are going to say, hey, 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 you just asked us that question last time. And if you remember, we said whether we were talking about apples or oranges, we said that the fruit comes from its own tree. And we said then, last time we were together, that apples come from apple trees. That's correct. But here's where I want to begin today with a slightly different question. Picking up from there, where do these apples come from? And are you sure that these are apples? Are you really sure? How sure are you? And let me ask this, how can you be sure what these really are? Because as I hold them up and you look, you can't touch them, you can't taste them. All you can do is look from a distance. And that's the point. You see, friends, today we're going to look at this question of how you can define and discern biblical spiritual fruit. How do you define and discern biblical fruit? When you think about what you just saw, if I were to ask you, how certain are you that that's natural genuine fruit, as opposed to unnatural plastic fruit. How certain could you be? How could you evaluate from where you are? If I were to say to you, I'll give you that it is natural fruit, how certain could you be that it was good fruit and not rotten fruit, without getting into the bag and looking behind what you couldn't see? You see, for all of us, it's critically important that we learn how to define and to discern biblical fruit. With that thought, as we get ready to go into God's Word together, I want to ask you to pray with me. Lord, I come to you today and I ask you to please, Lord, do the work here that I know is eternally important and that work which is amongst the most important that any Christian, any churchgoer, any true disciple could ever learn is going to be shared here today. I pray that in this time together that there will be those whose eyes are opened, those whose ears are given the ability to hear, those whose dead stone hearts will be replaced, as you've promised through your gospel, with hearts of flesh. That there will be those whose eternity changes today. And there will be others, Lord, who I pray will grow, will be sanctified, will be refined by your word and your spirit as we come and submit ourselves to you, our King. I ask this prayer and I lift this praise in the holy name of Jesus the Christ. Amen and amen. Well, here we go, friends. Again, I want to ask you to prepare for what only God can do. I'm going to share with you today a message that I've entitled, Defining and Discerning Biblical Fruit. Defining and Discerning Biblical Fruit. Let me remind you, we're in a sermon series entitled, Gospel Gardening, where we said this year that we would grab a hold of the truth that without a prophetic vision, the people will perish and that God has made it clear that we need to know his truth and love if we are to be his people. And we've been focusing on Christ, Christianity, and the church, looking at first the roots of the gospel, transitioning now to the fruits of the gospel, 
and will end later this year with the boots of the gospel, where collectively we've seen that from cover to cover, from beginning through the middle to the end of the Bible, everything is about the truth and love that is the roots of Christ's Christianity and his church. It's about the fruit that comes from him, the vine, that only when we abide in him and obey him will we ever be able to see and be the fruit of Almighty God. And we as the people of God who have become the benefactors of this amazing grace and eternal gospel, we then become the people who tell the rest of the world about the gospel's gardening and its roots fruits, and boots. Well, today, we're going to go in now into our third message, focusing on the fruits. Let me just, by way of review, remind you that we noted when we came from the roots into the fruits, we said, before we get into any of the details, we need to establish that all fruit, all true biblical fruit, is the byproduct of a miracle the miracle that only the Messiah can give, Jesus the Christ, and that miracle, when valid, will always lead to the mission that tells the story of the Messiah and the need for every man, woman, and child for the miracle of saving grace. Then last time we were together, we said it's not enough to know that everyone needs a miracle, the miracle, that we needed to understand this miracle and to recognize that it is only the muscle, the Holy Spirit of God, that can do and produce the fruit that comes out of that miracle. So in the last two sessions, we've seen that all biblical fruit, all true biblical fruit, is the byproduct of the miracle as demonstrated and empowered, Acts 1.8, through the muscle of the miracle, the Holy Spirit of God. And now today, we focus yet again on another foundational aspect, and that is this, that you, friends, need to recognize that if it is true biblical fruit, if it is a true salvific experience, if what you are looking at and dealing with and processing is genuine Holy Spirit-empowered, genuine, salvation-oriented, Christ-centered emotion, if that's what you're feeling and it's genuinely of the faith, then you will be experiencing a miraculous metamorphosis. Now, two years ago, we spent the entire year in a series entitled Miraculous Metamorphosis. And we said that it's only through the muscle of this miracle, only through the Messiah and his miracle, that we belly-crawling caterpillars could ever have any hope of becoming spirit-filled butterflies. And then we took the year to walk through what that process looked like in the life of the church. Well, today it's just a quick microcosm, but you can't jump over this. Before next week and the week after, we get into the describing and the dissecting of biblical fruit. Here we need to build on this genuine metamorphosis, this miraculous metamorphosis, and recognize that the defining and the discerning of biblical fruit is absolutely essential before we get into a deeper description and then dissection of this fruit. With that said, let me tell you what the big takeaway, the big idea, the timeless truth is for today. And my prayer is that you'll embrace this and then pursue it because what I'm about to share with you is arguably amongst the most important things you will ever hear and learn, I pray. The big idea for today is that fruit defining, biblical fruit defining and discerning is the first and arguably most important lesson any disciple of Christ should learn. Let me say that again. Biblical fruit defining and discerning is the first and arguably most important lesson 
any and all disciples of Jesus Christ need to learn. Why do we say that? Because if you don't understand what is truth in love, empowered by God's Spirit, you can and will be led astray. And that's what we're going to focus on here today. We're going to, I pray, help you to understand and be able to define and to discern biblical, true biblical fruit. Why is this so important? Let me share with you our text for today. It's Matthew chapter 12, verse 33, Jesus speaking. Now, just to give you context, just prior to this, he had just laid out the unforgivable sin. And right after this, he's about to call the Pharisees and the false teachers a bunch of vipers. So understand this. This is right in between two of the greatest warnings that our Lord ever laid out. And this is what he says in Matthew 12, 33. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree corrupt and its fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by its fruit. Do you hear Jesus? Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree corrupt and its fruit corrupt, because for the tree is known by its fruit. Everything in terms of the eternal condition is based on the reality of one's fruit, whether that's you personally or those that you are engaged with or being impacted by. And this is why I say to you the big idea is that you must, you must, you must understand. You must be able to define and discern true biblical fruit. It's your first and most important lesson to learn as a disciple. I pray that today you will be blessed as we engage in this process, and I pray God's Spirit builds you in this blessing. Now, I'm going to do some things here that are, again, a little bit heavy, but I pray it will lift you and enlighten your spirit. We're going to drink from another fire hose today. You see, last time when we were together and I shared with you the teaching on the Holy Spirit, the muscle in the miracle, I said to you that I would use two contemporary theologians amongst the best, Wayne Grudem and R.C. Sproul. And we looked at an extensive and biblical portrait of God's Holy Spirit to understand the muscle in the miracle. Well, today, as we get a biblical understanding of the metamorphosis that will define and help you to discern true biblical fruit, we're going to lean on yet another expert. This time, however, we're going back a few years, 275 years to be exact, almost to the day. And this time, we'll be working with and being blessed by the insights of Jonathan Edward as he was coming out of the first great awakening. Now, Jonathan Edwards is often referred to as the greatest preacher in the United States history. Many would say he's arguably the greatest theologian that our country has ever seen walk across our land. Some would go so far as to argue that he might just be the most brilliant mind that our country has ever produced. I'm sure if Edwards were here, he'd be far more humble than to accept those accolades. And he would be the first to point up and say anything that good, any good that comes out of him is the grace of God on display. Well, and I can tell you this, that what I'm going to share with you comes from a series of sermons that Jonathan Edwards preached that was later turned into a book entitled The Experience That Counts. And Edwards did this work because 275 years ago, just like today, just like 2,000 years ago when the New Testament was being brought together for us, there was confusion and there was corruption getting in the way of the commission of our Christ and our King. And so what Jonathan Edwards set out to do 
was to first acknowledge that there was a problem. That in the midst of God doing this amazing work called the First Great Awakening, that there became two factions in the Christian world. Some who were saying that this amazing move of God was now the norm and that unless you had sensationalized experiences and emotions, you obviously were not experiencing a real move of God. Now you can imagine how unhealthy that would be and how it would lead to carnival-like activities and circus-like atmospheres where everyone would try to outdo the other to make it look as though they were getting a bigger visitation or dose of God's blessing. Well, as the pendulum often does, it swang way far, way far to the other side, and there became another heretical movement. Those who said, if you have any expression of God's miraculous presence, that was a sign that you were also now off the plantation, and they would say that those were devil works, or those were sheer counterfeits because God was stoic, and there would never be any real moves demonstratively of God. No active, miraculous moves of God, because that was for the old times. Well, Edwards, recognizing, praise God, that both sides were wrong in their extremes, he set out to say, we need to rightly understand what is a true fingerprint of the faithful God that we serve. What does the genuine signature of God's Holy Spirit really look like? When can you tell if you are in fact in the presence of God making a move? And where and when do people over sensationalize and create man-made atmospheres that are not at all genuine expressions? Now, I would say to you, while Edwards preached his series from 1 Peter 1, I think we could go to many different places in the Bible and see that this point is being made from cover to cover again in the scriptures. Knowing the real God, knowing what is truly miraculous, knowing what comes from the muscle in the miracle, and understanding what represents a genuine miraculous metamorphosis is of eternal importance. It always was, and it always will be. And so, what I'd like to do is walk with you in light of, again, Matthew 12, 33, for the tree is known by its fruit. Well, you better be able to define and discern fruit if it's going to be at the heart of your eternal identity. And that's what we're going to aim to do here today, again, with the help of Jonathan Edwards. Let me tell you, we are going to do two things, two parts. We're going to understand the defining and the inspecting of biblical fruit, and then we're going to look at the actual inspection itself. With that said, let me now take you into uh, Edward's insights. We're going to look at understanding fruit, understanding, understanding itself, and then we're going to look at understanding the inspection process. So, Understanding biblical fruit. Here, I'm going to give you my own functional working definition, and I pray that this will bless you. Think about it this way. Biblical fruit, fruit, is always going to be the evidence, presence, and or byproduct of a source seed and its particular root system, as well as its growing season. Let me say that again, give it to you slowly. Fruit is the presence, it is the evidence, and or the byproduct of a particular source seed and its particular root system as well as its growing season. Now, you'll notice that that leaves room for healthy biblical spiritual fruit that which we will do more describing and dissecting in the coming weeks. But I want you to have a functional, faithful definition and recognize that that definition leaves room for bad, rotten, phony fruit as well. That it is, in its true definition, it is the evidence, the presence, and the byproduct of some source seed. Good seed, good fruit. Bad seed, bad fruit. 
It comes from its own particular root system. Bad seeds have bad roots. Good seeds have good roots. That's what Jesus said. Let the good tree be defined by its good fruit. Let the corrupt tree be defined by its corrupt fruit. We'll find that this process is grown in a season that is consistent with either the good or the bad fruit. Now, what we learn from Jonathan Edwards, again, I just want to help you to understand the understanding process itself. Edwards says, and I quote, the most crucial question for the human race, now hear this, again, this is Jonathan Edwards, he says, the most crucial question for the human race is this, what are the distinguishing marks of the people who enjoy God's favor? What are the distinguishing marks of the people who enjoy God's favor, comma, those who are on their way to heaven? Do you know what are the distinguishing marks of those people who have God's eternal favor evidenced by the fact that they are on their way to heaven? I would say to you again that this is the first and most important lesson that any and all disciples of Jesus Christ need to learn. Edwards goes on, he says, so much good and so much bad are mixed up in the church. So many admired Christ for a time, but even in the New Testament, few were faithful to the end. So you cannot see how somebody starts the race and get excited. You have to watch for the finish line. Edwards also says, this mixture of false religion with true religion has been Satan's greatest weapon against the cause of Christ. The mixture of the good and the bad in the church and a lack of discernment has been, quote, Satan's greatest weapon against the cause of Christ. This is why we must learn to distinguish between true and false religion, between emotions and experiences which really come from salvation versus the imitations which are outwardly attractive and even plausible, but false, end quote. He goes on and he says, Satan deludes people into thinking that they are holy when in reality they are hypocrites. False teaching feeds this system. And Edwards goes on, he says, the false teachers who feed the hypocrites who think that they are holy do more devastation to the church than outward overt enemies could ever do because they're doing their destruction from the inside. That's why he closes that section of his book and he says it's absolutely vital that we understand the difference between good and bad true and false fruit. Amen. Well, let me give you again just a little bit of his precursor in how he described and prepared his students, and I pray you and me, to rightly discern how to do this inspection. And I have to tell you, before I go any further, this work and this point, this lesson, is probably within the top five most influential important and impactful of my entire life. There, there are some times when you learn something that you realize, wow, this is a game changer forever. Well, friends, for me, this is one of those times. This is one of those lessons. And I pray it will be for you as well. Because once you see clearly how to define and discern the real versus the fake fruit you'll never be the same. Now that's a blessing, that's good news. It brings with it, however, an intensity, a responsibility, and a privilege to share what you learn. Part of that, per Edwards, it's how to interpret this understanding of realizing and coming into the inspection process. He points to Romans 12, 11, and he says it's clear through the scriptures. You and I have an obligation to come at this with a zeal and a passion that we cannot be lukewarm when it comes to this question and this point of discerning rightly what is real versus phony fruit. He goes on and Edward says just five points here. He says, number one, you need to be passionate and zealous in this pursuit. 
Number two, understand that no spiritual truth in and of itself ever changed a person's attitude or conduct unless it first aroused their emotions. Unless your emotions are in this, something's wrong. You may change your behavior, but you'll never change your belief until your heart and your passions, your emotions are gripped and are a part of this process. Third, he says, scripture everywhere places true religion mainly in our emotions. Understand that our emotions must be involved. Edward says that it's in our fears, our hopes, our love, our hatred, our desire, our joys, our sorrows, our gratitude, our compassion, even our zeal. And he quotes here, one of my favorite verses, Titus 2.14, Christ gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself a special people, a special people zealous for good works. Now, my life verse follows that. The next verse is that you are to declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. That's how important this is. The fourth point here, Edward says, the right way is neither to reject all emotions nor to approve all emotions, but rather we are to discern the right from the wrong. He says, quote, we must separate between the wheat and the weeds. Amen. End quote. Lastly, before we get into the actual inspection process, Edwards told his students, God has given us emotions for the same purpose as all other powers he's given us. We have emotion to serve man's chief end, to grow in our relationship with God. Every emotion you have has an ultimate purpose to help you to grow in your relationship with God that you may be able to become a greater glorifier for our King. Edwards goes on, he says, sadly, while this is why we've received our emotions, quote, yet how common is it for human emotions to be taken up with everything except spiritual realities? In matters of people's worldly interests, now, now remember, this is 275 years ago. Jonathan Edwards says, quote, in matters of people's worldly interests, their outward delights, their reputation, and their natural relations, in these things, their desires are eager, their love is warm, and their zeal is ardent or great. Yet, how insensitive and unmoved most people are about spiritual things. Here, their love is cold, their desires are sluggish, and their gratitude is small, end quote. Edwards is drawing our focus to the fact that when we talk about the things that God is zealous for, the things that God is passionate for, most people, especially those that are religious but not yet redeemed, they give lip service and lukewarm attentiveness to the things that God is most passionate about. And yet they find themselves typically consumed and most passionate about the things that are most worldly, most self-centered, most surface and superficial. I want you to think about it this way. When it comes to living the life of a Christian, how committed are you to the koinonia, the supernatural unity of the body of Christ? For this Christ died. For this, Christ prayed passionately in John 17. And yet, to Jonathan Edwards' point, most people are not concerned about the witness that they have in their supernatural unity. Instead, they pursue superficial relationships that may suit their fancy and make them comfortable, but don't do anything for the glory of God. They grieve the Spirit, they quench the spirit and the degree to which they prioritize their own desires over bringing glory to God, they will outrage the Holy Spirit. Do you see the relationship and the importance of getting this right? It's not just about an academic exercise of learning some theology. This is about the very heartbeat of our God. This is about the very witness and walk 
and actually the very warfare that is the heart, at the heart of genuine versus counterfeit worship. Amen. Well, to this end, we now move to the inspecting. We've looked at understanding fruit, understanding how to understand, and we've done a quick overview of understanding the inspection process. Well, let's now get into the inspection process. And let me tell you here, we have two major divisions. We have the maybe, maybe not experiences. And I'll explain that in a minute. And then we have the trustworthy, the true and trustworthy experiences that do represent a miraculous move of God, a miraculous metamorphosis. Now, when we look at this, what Edwards was saying, what Jesus wants you and me to understand and get is that there are moves that may be evidence of God's miraculous metamorphosis underway. However, many of those are not in and of themselves proof or evidence. And here, the problem is not that these things are bad versus good. The problem is that many people think that these good things validate a God thing. And that's not necessarily the case. That you could have a major positive experience with the God of the Bible. Nobody can test that but you may still be lost. The greatest example that I point to in this scenario is the Apostle Paul, his experience on the road to Damascus. Jesus comes to him, stops him dead in his tracks, blinds him, talks to him, directs him. Paul then obeys and does as instructed, and he's still lost. This is the Apostle Paul. He's still lost. We see that God directs him and then sends a man named Ananias to Straight Street to meet him. And we're told there that Ananias is there going to impart the Holy Spirit to Saul then who will become Paul. The point being, if Paul pointed to all that he experienced on the Damascus Road and never went through with what God did at the Straight Street encounter, he would have died lost having had arguably the greatest encounter with the risen Christ, expressing, much like the rich young ruler, a sense of awareness and obedience, but not yet the miraculous metamorphosis that only comes through the miracle done by the muscle, the Holy Spirit, who is going to be coming to Straight Street, and which proves itself through the metamorphosis, again, with the Apostle Paul, that happened at Straight Street. Jonathan Edwards says, we must be clear of those good things that may or may not be God things. And we must say to the people, please do not misunderstand. While this is obviously and at least apparently good, it is no guarantee that it is the saving, miraculous metamorphosis of God. Let me walk through 12 of these examples. Again, I know it's like drinking from a fire hose. I encourage you to come back to the notes. I'm going to give you my preaching notes as well as my cliff notes of the entire work of Edwards. So just listen and take this in. Let it wash over you and I pray inform, inspect, and even inspire your worship and your walk, I pray. Okay, when we see that somebody's emotions, their experiences, the fruit, comes with strong and lively emotions. I mean, they are, they are absolutely convinced and they are excited and exuberant. Edward says, you cannot bank on that experience or those emotions. They could be, but they may not be evidence of God at work. Now, just think about what that says. That means no matter how emotional, how enthusiastic, it does not in and of itself prove anything. It may be good, but it's no guarantee of God's gospel miracle creating the metamorphosis. Number two, he says when emotions create a great effect on the body, oh, they began to weep and cry and, and all kinds of physical bodily effects. They're, they're singing, they're, they're, they're falling and just getting on their face before God. That's good. I hope it's great. 
but it's no guarantee. You cannot see these things and attribute it to the miraculous work of God. Again, it could be good, but it's no guarantee that it's God. Can you see where we're going here? This is going to get a little difficult because people must understand the truth in love. So many are led astray because they've not been taught these truths. Number three, if in fact the experience, the fruit, seems to generate a real warmth in somebody's heart, spirit, attitude, personality, and now they want to talk about Jesus all the time, that's good, but it's not necessarily great. It may sound like the message got through, but in and of itself, it's no guarantee that the miraculous metamorphosis from the muscle himself has taken place. If we do not produce this emotion, if we can say, listen, I didn't do this. This was, this was thrust upon me. I didn't generate these emotions or these fruit experiences. I know I didn't do it. It was done to me. Again, People will quickly give God the credit, and we must acknowledge God's word tells us that not every experience with a spirit comes from his spirit or anything positive, but sometimes we must test the spirits because we know that the devil himself and his minions can come down disguised as an angel of light. So you can't just accept this and call it biblical fruit. Number five, if these experiences come with a biblical verse attached. Oh no, I know this is true, Pastor Jeff, because it's when I heard that verse, when the pastor said those words, when, when that Bible verse was laid out or passage was read. All you need to do is look at Satan tempting Jesus three times quoting scripture. Listen, if the devil can quote scripture to try to tempt Jesus, he can do the same thing with you. It's no guarantee just because there was a verse or a passage there from the Bible. Have you seen yet what's missing? All these experiences, while good, are not gospel-centered. These are not declaring and responding to the gospel of Jesus the Christ. Number six, if it seems as though there's genuine love in these new emotions, if it seems like a genuine warm-heartedness, he says, Edwards here, quote, unfortunately, love can be imitated, end quote. Just because somebody seems now to suddenly be loving, again, it's a good thing, but it's no guarantee of God's miraculous work. Again, Edwards, unfortunately, love can be imitated. He goes on to say that if you'll read Matthew 24, 12 and 13, you'll see that there is love that doesn't endure, which proves itself never to have been genuine biblical love, which means that it wasn't genuine biblical fruit. Edward says, many Jews who praised Jesus so highly and followed him day and night without food, without drink or sleep, those same Jews later grew cold and did not endure. And the point being that the great start and the surface emotional responses are no guarantees of a miraculous work or outcome. Number seven, when experiences feel and draw new emotions to the surface, it doesn't mean anything. And here Edwards gave us a great illustration. He said, picture someone whom Satan comes to and deceives into thinking that God has forgiven their sins. So Satan deceives somebody into thinking that God has forgiven their sins. Let us suppose Satan deceives that person through a vision of a man with a beautiful smiling face and open arms. The sender believes, the sender believes this is a vision of Christ. Or perhaps Satan deludes him with a voice saying, son, your sins are forgiven, which the sinner thinks is the voice of God. So the sinner believes he is saved, even though he has no spiritual understanding of the gospel. What a variety of emotions would come into this sinner's mind. He would be full of love for his imaginary savior, whom he thinks has saved him from hell. He would be full of gratitude for his imaginary salvation. He would feel an overwhelming joy. His emotions would move him to talk about this with others and share his experience. 
It would be easy for him to be humble before his imaginary God. He would deny himself and zealously promote his imaginary religion while the warmth of his emotions lasted, end quote. The point being, if deceived by Satan into thinking that they were saved, which is easily done, then yes, you might see emotions and even zeal and passion and sacrifice. But if it's not grounded and anchored in the gospel of Jesus the Christ, if it's not the miraculous metamorphosis that can only be done by the muscle in that miracle, God, the Holy Spirit, then it does not mean anything. Number eight, if this experience, if this fruit brings a sense of comfort and joy, he says again, Edwards, a fear of hell and a conviction of sin are two totally different things. If all of a sudden you have this peace and this comfort and this sense of joy because you have this sense that you're no longer going to hell. Listen, a fear of not going to hell does not equate to biblical conviction and repentance. That's the point. Satan can produce, says Edwards, a false conviction of sin, a false fear of hell, a false humility before God. Why would he not then produce a false joy in the gospel? We know that he does this. Scripture alone, God's word alone, is our infallible guide to true and trustworthy religious belief and practice. You've heard it from me and in our Bridge family. God's word, God's will, and God's way. That's the only reliable, eternal blueprint. And if anyone or anything offers you any feeling, emotion, promise, or guarantee that is not grounded in the gospel, expressed in God's word, through God's will, and God's way, then it cannot be trusted. Number nine, if your emotions cause you to spend much time now doing God's work, if, if the fruit is the sweat equity, there is no, no amount of work that can substitute for the miraculous gift of God's Holy Spirit in and through the gospel. So just because somebody now gets busy, and just think about how many times, maybe you yourself, I know I was there, how many times you've seen people suddenly, oh, I'm, now I'm going to church three times a week. Oh, I'm doing all this work for God. I'm, it doesn't mean anything eternally. If they produce an assurance of salvation, listen, the people who were cheering on God at the Red Sea were later grumbling and complaining and wanting to go back to Egypt. The people on Palm Sunday who were cheering, Hosanna, Hosanna, when Jesus was coming in, waving their palm branches, were literally just a few days later yelling, crucify him, crucify him. We must see what is connected to the gospel and the gospel alone. You see, friends, a faith lacking spiritual light is not the faith of children of light, but instead it is the delusion of the children of darkness. That's what Edward says. Those who insist on living by faith without spiritual experiences and obedience have absurd, absolutely idiotic ideas of faith. What they really mean by faith is simply that they believe that they are saved and going to heaven. That is why they think it is sinful to doubt their salvation, no matter how dead and worldly they are. End quote. Jonathan Edwards, 275 years ago. It's as though he were walking the streets with us today. Last one here, and then I'm going to give you a little rapid fire on the evidences and the true and trustworthy fruit aspects that you could and should be looking for. Edward says, just because somebody has a great sounding testimony, if the fruit seems to play into a great sounding testimony, it does not mean anything without the anchor and the truth of the miraculous work of the muscle, the Holy Spirit of God, through the gospel of Jesus Christ, as planned for and drawn by the Father, John 6:44. Even the wisest Christians, friend, take heart. Edward says, now look, with all of this, know that you can still be buffaloed by fake believers. He says, quote, no Christian can infallibly distinguish between true and false believers. Even the wisest Christian can be deceived. You see, friends, we can't tell what only God can tell. What we can tell is the truth. 
And the truth is that these are not guarantees. And oftentimes people settle for the good enough of this activity without surrendering to the gospel of the Almighty. And consequently, they deal with a mechanical ministry and never come to know the miraculous muscle and the miraculous mission and metamorphosis that the Holy Spirit of lo uh, alone is able and wanting to do. Now, Edward says as he transitions to the evidences and the true and trustworthy fruit, he says, listen, talk is cheap. We must judge by the fruit, by the lasting results in people's lives. The way professing Christians live is the best proof we have of their sincerity and their salvation. Friends, the best lesson you can have about somebody's faithful and fruitful living is their fruitfulness or lack thereof. And that's whether you're dealing with people outside or the person in the mirror. Now, I'm gonna give you 14 quick references that Edwards brings up. And I wanna again encourage you to go to the notes. You'll have a deep, rich pool of blessing here. But rapid fire, here are the true and trustworthy evidences of biblical fruit. One, true spiritual emotion, fruit, arises from spiritual, supernatural, and divine influences on the heart. It is the miracle that only the Messiah and the muscle can give you that will lead you to this mission. He says, true spiritual emotions, true spiritual fruit, arise from supernatural influences. Again, this is Jonathan Edwards speaking. He says, the witness of the Holy Spirit is not some spiritual whisper or immediate revelation. It is the holy effect of God's Spirit in the hearts of his believers, leading them to love God, hate sin, and pursue holiness. He goes on and he says, how many lively but false emotions have arisen from this delusion? How many times have people been self-affirmed and self righteous in their assessments of what God had nothing to do with. He goes on and he says, terrible harm has resulted from thinking that the Holy Spirit's witness is a kind of inward voice or a suggestion or a declaration from God to a man that he is loved, forgiven, elect, and so forth. He said, when somebody comes and says, oh no, God told me this. If it's not evidenced by life-transforming fruit, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, the old is gone, the new is come. A new creation was born like Lazarus. You see the evidences of the dead coming alive spiritually. That's the proof. That's the gospel evidence. Number two, he says, the object of spiritual emotion is the loveliness of spiritual things not our self-interest. He says anything is lovely to a selfish person if it advances his or her self-interest. So it's not evidence of biblical fruit if it makes somebody happy when they're selfish. It's when it brings God glory through them. He says true love begins with God and loves God for God's own sake. Self-love begins with self and loves God in the interest of oneself. So look for what brings glory to God. Number three, spiritual emotion, spiritual biblical fruit is based on moral excellence of spiritual things. True spiritual fruit is going to desire more biblical holiness and that which comes with it. Number four, spiritual emotions, real biblical fruit, arise out of spiritual understanding. Edward says, if you don't understand the gospel, you're not going to be able to be a part of the fruit producing that comes from the gospel. Quote, we need to understand scripture intellectually and taste the holy beauty of that meaning with our hearts. End quote. So important. Number five, biblical fruit will bring a conviction of the reality of divine things. When the Bible's Holy Spirit has done a holy work in a biblical believer and transformation has happened, conviction comes. Not the kind of conviction you sweep under the rug, but the kind of conviction that grabs a hold of you and literally, ready, convicts you to the point of repentance and praise God by grace restoration. Amen. 
You show me somebody who knows no conviction and I'll show you somebody who knows no Christ. Number six, spiritual emotions, biblical fruit, always exist alongside spiritual humiliation. He said, listen, there are many proud hypocrites who pretend to be humble. If there's truly been this miraculous metamorphosis, biblical humility will come. Seven, biblical fruit always exists alongside a true change of nature. You're not going to start to grow apples until you become an apple tree. You're not going to begin to live and breathe and have life until you're brought back to life from the dead. If, in fact, your nature has changed, the fruit of your nature will be revealed. And, again, you'll see it in the fruit. Their tree is defined by their fruit. Number eight, Edward says, True spiritual emotions, biblical fruit, differs from the false ones in that it promotes a Christ-like spirit of love, humility, peace, forgiveness, and compassion. Edward says, If these things are lacking or they're not evidence, then there's an evidence of a lacking of the miraculous metamorphosis that only the gospel can bring. Number nine, True spiritual emotions and biblical fruit soften the heart and exist alongside a Christian tenderness of spirit. Friends, I will tell you that for me, this is perhaps one of the greatest demonstrations that affirmed in my heart that I have been changed. I am not who I used to be. I have a long, long way to go. But let me tell you, I have come to know my brother Rob. I love him. We, we share this. God tenderized us in a way that could never be done any other way or by any other source. A demonstration of the miracle, the muscle, and the metamorphosis can be seen in many of us by how he has tenderized our heart. Such people do not accept Christ. Those who reject this, they do not accept Christ as their savior from sin. See, there are those who still want to hold on to their sin. They think Christ didn't save them from their sin, but he saved them for their sin. Those who still have that hardened heart are lacking the evidence of true biblical fruit. Number 10, true biblical fruit, unlike false, has a beautiful symmetry. It cares about the soul and the body, the near and the far. It is a biblical Christ-like symmetry, a harmonizing of the loving up, the loving in, and the loving out, the being the church locally, regionally, and globally, of caring for the eternal soul and the here and now body. Being 1 John 3.18, let us not love with word and tongue, but in action and in truth. Number 12, Edward says that true biblical fruit will bring with it three steps. There will be a commitment to biblical authority. There will be an absolute priority of holiness. And there will be the fruit of perseverance. Amen. So simple, so biblical, and yet so lost on so many. We hear Edwards go on and he says the sign of the genuine Christian, the sign of genuine Christian fruit is that the Christian perseveres through problems and difficulty, remaining true to Christ. Remember, it's Revelation 2.10 that says, Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Show me somebody who quits, who doesn't make it to the finish line, and I'll tell you somebody who failed the test of faith. Not by my words. This is the word of God. This is what needs to be understood. Edward says, Christ is not in the heart of the Christian as a dead savior. You can't die and lose if he's in you because he's the living Christ and he's never dying again. And none of those that he's given life to will ever die again spiritually. So here's the evidence. When somebody appears to have died spiritually, when they've gone off course, when they've left the family and the faith, and they declare themselves or prove themselves to be out of the faith and the family. This is 1 John 2.19. They prove that they were never in the family, evidenced by the fact that they've left the faith and the family. Again, 1 John 2.19. This is Jesus' teaching. He goes on and he says, if an unconverted person 
tries to live a Christian life. So picture it. It's the lost person trying to act like a Christian person in the church, but not truly in Christ. Jonathan Edwards, 275 years ago, says, quote, if an unconverted person tries to live a Christian life, it is like throwing a stone up in the air. Nature finally prevails and the stone comes down again. You can only fake it for so long. And that's what you see, friends. That's what grieves me. When the declaration and the sharing of truth and love drives people away, I'm reminded that the gospel of Jesus Christ will divide the crowds and unify the church. That's the truth. And the fruit tells the story of the tree and the root. Okay, number 13, two left. Christian practice, biblical fruit, is the chief sign to others of a convert's sincerity. What Edwards is saying is the best proof of your biblical fruit is your biblical fruit. Your greatest witness to the world is your biblical fruit. It is the witness that serves as the greatest witness to the witness. Amen and amen. Think about this, Matthew 7, 16, again, Jesus speaking. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? No, Jesus says the fruit tells you what the tree and the root system really is. And Edwards goes on and says, nowhere, nowhere does Christ say, you will know the tree by its leaves and its flowers. No, not what it looks like, but what it actually produces. Everything we say is worthless, says Edwards, if it is not confirmed by what we do. Here he's quoting James 2.14. Again, talk is cheap. It is by costly, self-defying, self-denying Christian practice that we show the reality of our faith. We cannot, says Edwards, be certain how far an unconverted person can go in an outward appearance of Christianity. There's no way of telling. And that's the last point, is to understand that the best sign of a conversion is the fruit of one's conversion. And recognize that you can never know where somebody else stands. You can never ultimately know. All we can do is share these truths. Edward says, when Christ says, by their fruits you will know them, this is, in the first place, a rule for judging others. But... Christ also wants us to judge ourselves by this rule, as the next verse clearly declares. Listen to Matthew 6, 21, the next verse. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. You see, Christian practice is the best proof of Christian practice. Christian biblical fruit over time is the best evidence and proof that it is truly biblical fruit. Edward says Christian practice both includes an inward set of motives as well as an outward set of actions and methods. If we ignore, says Edwards, God's clear emphasis on genuine biblical Christian practice and we then begin to stress other things as tests of the validity of one's faith, we are on our way to delusion and hypocrisy. When the social gospel takes the place of the gospel, there's a problem and we're heading down the road of delusion and hypocrisy. Edward speaking 275 years ago, right into our today. Friends, know this, that all of this activity it doesn't mean that you get saved by this. It means that this is the evidence of your having been saved. You are not saved by the fruit you produce. The fruit you produce comes from the reality that you were saved through the miracle from the Messiah in the power of the muscle, the Holy Spirit, who does the miraculous metamorphosis. That's the point. That's the lesson. That's why it's so important that you learn how to define and to discern true biblical fruit. It's the first and most important lesson every Christian disciple needs to learn. I beg you, I beg you to take this to heart. 
think about it again. We've now gone into this discussion and this teaching on the very fruit of the faith. We've seen that it comes from the miracle through the muscle and it will lead to a miraculous metamorphosis. I leave you with this verse. It's 2 Corinthians 13, 5. And this is where I pray it will become very personal and that this lesson and these notes in particular will bless you and others without end. God's word, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Test yourselves. Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves? That Jesus Christ is in you. That Jesus Christ is in you. Unless, indeed, you fail the test. Test yourself. Examine yourself. Know that Christ is in you if he is. With these biblical certainties, know that he is. And don't be afraid to test and examine. Because even if you fail the test and learn that he isn't, that's his grace. And it is perhaps the loudest call you will ever hear of him drawing you to the amazing grace of his beautiful gospel. Oh Lord, I pray that each one within the sound of my voice will embrace this call to recognize the tree by its fruit, to test oneself each one within the sound of my voice, to celebrate again with great certainty and biblical accuracy their salvation, or by your grace to be brought again to the gospel, that they may surrender to victory and receive, I pray, your miraculous work through your miraculous muscle, you, Holy Spirit, that the miraculous metamorphosis may happen and that they may not only enjoy and taste but become biblical fruit to the glory of our God. Amen and amen.